busy here at ITF playing and last night got to play a little bit uh, at the jam session. We had to cut it a little short last night. We weren't able to have a jam session um, just because the rhythm section has been slammed and they have been playing like all day nonstop without without a break since 11 a.m. So uh, we, we cut that short. But last night was super fun. We got to play some new tunes. We got to play a Curtis Fuller tribute. I uh, played the tune The Court. Uh, then we played one of my favorite Ellington tunes, uh, Star-Crossed Lovers. Got to play with Tony Baker. Got to play with one of my students, Jack Courtright. So it was a lot of fun last night. Posted about it yesterday, but I um, wrote a book of duets, and um, we're pretty excited about that. Pre-sale copies are available at the ITF merch table, and if ever anybody wants to do that or wants to go and um, play some of those duets, uh, find me, and we'll find. Let's see if we can find a time today or tomorrow. So I hope people can check out those duets. I'm excited to get those actually out, but I got some of those preview copies here at ITF. If you want to record a duet with me, hit me up. How do you go about making your own etudes? Um, There's something that I do with my students quite a bit, and it's a really useful exercise um, being able to. I, I like to think about it either in one of two ways. One is thinking about making an etude that works on something specific. So that might be using a certain type of melodic material, harmonic material, uh, rhythmic material, and saying, all right, I'm going to try to write an etude using this particular material over these sets of chord changes. And then another way that I like to think about it is thinking that I'm going to write, like, if I could compose a solo that was killing, what would it sound like? What would, the, you know, what would the rhythms be? What would the lines be? And would it be multiple choruses, one chorus? And try to compose out of time something that you like and something that is, uh, you find that sounds great. And so that, that way you can practice sounding great on your material and you're not just um, regurgitating some other etude or you're not um, just playing only transcriptions. It's kind of just trying to bring all the worlds together and make sure that you're able to get your ideas out. So that's what why I talk about like composition is an extension of improvisation and vice versa. And so like uh, that's why I launched last week or two weeks ago the composition course, mini, mini course. And you can check that out if you want to dabble into uh, writing and arranging uh, some jazz music with a kind of a, you know, not regimented, but, you know, step-by-step -step process of getting into it. So if it's something you're interested, you could check that out. But uh, the etudes thing is really a helpful exercise for um, getting your ideas out of your head, getting them onto the paper, and being able to play them. Since lessons are primarily focused on getting better at your instrument, how can you, as a professor slash teacher, make sure your students aren't making professional mistakes? Oh, I don't think there's a way to make sure that they're not making professional mistakes unless they ask. You know, it's something that we all try to impart on students, you know, like certain best practices or ideas about not get, not getting in your own way, things like that. The, the, having those conversations, being open to talk about those things, but unless you ask, it's not really going to come up, you know. You know, we try to talk about those things, but it's you got to play gigs, you know. I mean, we played a gig together. I mean, in general, if you want to be professional, the best practices you will the best practices for being professional at being a professional musician I mean it's simple man you show up and you're prepared you make life easy for the band leader you do what you're asked to do and just imagine you know like if you've ever led a gig you know you know what it's like to get a band together and all those things that's why I encourage people to do their own projects and get their own things together because it's really hard and there it's really hard to be able to um, understand what that feels like and how much work goes into it until you've done it yourself. And then you know all the things that you could do to be like more helpful, more useful, make things go more smoothly, you know? So I just try to do that. So that's number one, always be early, you know, on time is late, that kind of thing. And just take care of business, you know? Like just do what you're asked to do, uh, start on time, end on time, make life easy for the venue, for the staff, and don't be a jerk. There's some things you just learn from doing and you're not gonna be able to sort them out until you have more experience uh, and with dealing with people and knowing when to say no. And you have to play. We were talking about this last night. A great bass trombone is to teach us in West Virginia. Uh, Hakeem Bilal, we were talking about just like all the things you do, all the gigs you play, all the th weird ways that you meet other musicians uh, and just being available and being open and being uh, cool. <laughs> you know, just be cool. Just don't be a jerk, you know. But that's the best thing you can do, you know, just be a nice person. Be yourself. Ask questions, you know, of people if you need clarification. I always say, you know, that um, disagreements always come from missed expectations or unclear expectations between two parties, you know. Relationship, whether it's a friendship, it's always some kind of misunderstanding of, of expectations that kind of lead to conflict. 
whether small conflict or large conflict. So who are some deceased musicians you'd like to meet? Who would you meet if you could only pick one? Uh, Duke, Duke Ellington. I don't know, man. He's just my a hero of mine. Like, there's so many things about how he persisted, how he changed over time, how he featured his band on his music, how he collaborated, how he kept going. Yeah, he's super inspiring in a lot of ways. And just like his dedication to melodicism and not being afraid to experiment, not like following the rules all the time, voice leading. And, you know, he was just, he had a great balance of showmanship and musicianship, just so many things, you know, he's obviously a great pianist, but yeah, the way that he was able to keep his band on the road for 50 years, man, is pretty incredible. Something that I aspire to to be able to do myself. I mean, I'm not going to lead a big band like that. Different times, you know. Have you studied any Slonimsky thesaurus melodic vanish? Yeah, Slonimsky, if you don't know that, we've talked about him a couple times recently. Uh, if you don't know how to spell that, it's Slonimsky, S-L-O-N-I-M-S-K-Y, Slonimsky. Thesaurus melodic patterns. I haven't really, um, I mean, yes, I've checked it out, but I don't like only math when I think about uh, music. So I like to think about the sounds and how they feel and uh, putting different shapes on top of each other so I, I work more from like a shape perspective than I do like a scale or melodic patterns perspective I mean maybe we're talking about the same thing and just thinking about it two different ways um, but for me that's how I think about it I think about shapes I don't think about scales other than it's like a certain sound like it's a mode or it's like a color or something all, all a scale is is a collection of notes which is a sound you know, it's a shape. It's a seven note shape or an eight note shape in the case of a diminished as opposed to a triad. That's a three note shape. I like to use, um, if anyone's familiar with uh, set theory and uh, stuff like that, I, I like to take kind of some of that ethos of like organizing things by pitch collections and turning it into shapes. So like you would say C major triad, C, E, and G, you would call it O, four, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, O, four, seven forget sometimes I have to re and that would represent a major scale and so or a major triad and so a minor would be 037 diminished 036 right so it's talking about the half steps so it's labeling the notes so anyway when you're using when you're using that you can use it like a shape I like is like o one o two o two uh, five seven so like C D F G and then you change it like o one five seven and then you get a different sound a different shape uh, and anyway so Solonimsky has all these other kind of things that are other shapes and I don't find that it's that useful you know like all that stuff is like candy or something like you think like it, you feel inspired to like go and find these cool little nuggets or like these cool licks or lines or whatever you're going to get them out of like this Solonimsky thing that um, Coltrane used and all that but it's like it doesn't get you most of the way the fastest like still like the fundamentals of like uh, harmony and how harmony works is like the best thing to learn first you know all that other stuff is just decoration it's not um it's not going to get you like mastery you know that's like all right you've got it together and now you're hungry for more right that's like you gotta you gotta wait on that stuff because it's not really useful it doesn't replace anything that you need to know beforehand like diminished scales or altered scales you know just using that melodic minor those kind of basic jazz harmony things are a bit more important, I think, than um, worrying too much about the Slonimsky, although there is cool stuff in there. And if you're on that kind of path, you want to check out also Oliver Messian's Modes of Limited Transposition. So what are your thoughts on the JJ Etude book? Do you get anything beneficial from it? Well, of course you get something beneficial from it. I think JJ, I think it's interesting that JJ wrote that book and it doesn't sound like his playing. That's super interesting to me. And he kind of tried to write like more modern kind of sounding stuff. So I haven't spent that much time playing out of the JJ Etude book, to be honest. I take more time with his trans transcriptions than the Etude book. But there's something to get out of everything. So And it's really interesting to, to kind of see what he was thinking about and what he was doing um, musically. You know, it's, it's interesting to see like where someone goes. That's a, another connection between the musicianship and the um, improvisation, the composition and improvisation. Those two things like... JJ was dealing with all different stuff compositionally than he was playing wise necessarily you know it's almost like two different people you know it's it's very interesting but you know he was writing third stream and he was writing all this like kind of interesting brass music and there was a lot of stuff he was doing that was not just like a straight ahead like bebop jazz trombone solo so that's an insight I think 
to to checking out that book and like saying like this is what he was into you know like he was checking this out um and maybe it helps you to expand your musical horizons to know that like just because you play a certain way or you kind of get into a box doesn't mean you have to stay there you can keep on moving and pushing yourself into new directions you know you don't have to feel like you're in one place you can feel you can be free to do your thing do local dialects creep into a person's articulation slash tone and have you noticed any particular issues with any of the geographic areas i wouldn't say that it's an issue uh but i will say that i do think there is dialects in jazz and dialects in um language jazz language and style and from across even just the country i think there's different approaches so yeah dialects is a good word to use i think because like just think about the difference between J.J. Johnson and Frank Rosalino or J.J. Johnson and Carl Fontana. Kind of it's split somewhere in the hard bop area. I call it like a West Coast style and an East Coast style. Like one is more clean and clear and one is a little bit more like fluid. Fluidity is like a more prized aspect of it than like the cleanliness. Not that you can't take away great things from both, but like there is. There's just, di there's just different sound, different priorities, different... Um, things different way of navigating i mean you can think about that like the sound changes the articulation changes when you think about east coast versus west coast versus like maybe some european cats like they're playing a different kind of sound concept uh, swing concept and then another thing that happens is there's also regional like tunes like when i was at eastman there were certain tunes people like to play and then certain tunes at juilliard and then certain tunes in florida and certain tunes in texas certain tunes on the west coast like every little kind of community has their own tunes and it comes from the the more seasoned veteran musicians kind of hipping the younger cats to like hey check this out check this out check this out so there were certain tunes that people played in the umt trombone studio and then i showed up and was like oh let's play all these other tunes that you guys don't know you know and uh but when i was at eastman there was all these tunes that people like to play they're not even the same anymore like for example it seemed like everybody played i mean you and the old milestones when i was at eastman and now it doesn't seem like people play those tunes anymore. All right, what is it like judging the ITA solo competitions? Uh, it's cool, man. You get to hear the young cats. Uh, as a person who never won an ITA competition as a student, it's very interesting to be a judge uh, now and uh, think about what it was like to either win or not win, you know. But the important thing I think to take away from it is that it doesn't really matter. A lot of my friends won those competitions and they're doing great. I didn't win the competition, you know. Our experience in life doesn't seem to be all that different based on whether or not we won or lost an ITA competition, even though it's nice to get those things and ha have those affirmations. It's, Im it's important to get those, you know, whatever you want to call them. I'll just call them affirmations, you know, along the way. You need, everybody needs a little push, you know, like, yeah, man, you're doing the thing. You're doing a good job. Um, so even just to like be here and like be up chosen as a finalist is is enough, man. It, it's a good affirmation. Um, it's hard to be a judge because um, you have to. It always comes down to like taste. Yeah, depending who the judges are on a given day at a competition, it's like that's who's going to win. You know, given that everybody plays well and plays, but you know how they can play because we know they can play because they sent in a tape where they demonstrated that they could play. So it's always like a stylistic preference like for example for me my criteria when i hear somebody is that i would prefer to hear somebody that takes some chances uh, and plays their ideas uh, more than somebody who's going to get up there and just try to be a clone of elliot mason of michael dees of jj of curtis of whomever you know it doesn't matter it's like you got to be yourself to me, you know, that's what I'm saying. If I'm the judge, I'm going to be like, well, you got to play well. If you play, the, don't, you don't have a good sound. You can't play the trombone. I'm not going to uh, think that you're probably the winner, you know. So you got to have those fundamental things together. And then from there, you got to demonstrate that you have a, a knowledge of the music and the history, because that's important to me. Like, you got to know where this is coming from. Uh, and then connect to that history and demonstrate that history. And then the th that last step is the like application of like, but this is my opinion, you know? If you, if you don't have an opinion, you're not sharing your own opinion. It's kind of like a, what's the point, you know? That's kind of what I think. So that's what it's like to be a judge. So it's hard, man, because it's always like, well, they all played great. How do you pick a winner? And sometimes it's super clear. There's like one person 
has developed faster than the others. And that's what it's about. It's like there's this kind of arbitrary categories that they put on it because they do it by age, right? They don't do it by experience. <laughs> they don't do it like, oh, I've been playing for one year or 10 years or something and you, how far you've developed, you know, 25 and under and 22 and under is completely just like random some people started playing jazz right away and some people play, started playing jazz in high school some people didn't start playing jazz until college so like one of my students that's a he was an alternate for both competitions he's not really ever studied jazz until um he was dabbling in undergrad and now he's doing a jazz masters and so he's doing a great job and coming a long way but it's important to come and see the, these young cats and like get to know them and i think as it's important as a members of this community to try to uplift those voices you know if for me it's i followed along since i was in high school like i followed every year who the people are i want to know who they are and how they play and you know what's the level you know what what's the expectation of me to be competitive on the scene not in a like competitive sense but be competitive to be employed you know to be in the ballpark of like skills and language and all those sort of things i just think if you have like a calm centered musical approach that's the best musical approach you know not trombone approach musical approach and the, the thing that i've always i've been thinking about the last couple of days kind of hearing different people and seeing different people hearing the finalists for the competitions playing the last couple of nights and at a master class then hearing people like john fedchak who's one of the artists at itf this year you know the difference you know between them and him and i'm kind of somewhere in the middle you know but like there's like a, a he has such like a calm confidence in the way that he expresses his musicianship um that's really inspiring to me and and something that like younger cats they just haven't had time to develop yet and it's okay you know like that's just how it goes and so i'm like man i wish i could go back and listen to myself and those things and be able to kind of think about it with this new lens you know that's what i've always done is focus on the mu trying to be a, a a music first person asking like what does the music need right now engaging the rhythm section playing as a band that's my priority you know what i'm not my priority isn't to like shred who are some of your biggest non-trombone inspirations improvisationally i had i mean i had a bunch of different phases where i was super deep into one person for a while so there was a joshua redmond phase there was a michael brecker phase there was a pat metheny phase there was a herbie there was a chick you know, I would say that those ones are pretty big as non-trombonists in terms of vocabulary, in terms of approach, in terms of things like that. I, w I would say that, I mean, I also had a deep dive into, into someone like Clifford Brown. I think, you know, for trombonists, like he's like pretty clear and pretty approachable because his articulation style was more, he tongued more notes, you know, than Freddie, for example. So like it's a little more accessible for us to play, you know, as trombonists. So I, I did some deep dive into Clifford Brown. I tried to transcribe the Chick Corea, Now He Sings, Now He Sobs stuff. It's hard to play a piano stuff on trombone, you know, it's a, it can be too angular and they don't have to breathe. I think the harmonic sensibilities, you know, have um, stuck around for sure. Would it be helpful to think of improv as one scale that is constantly changing? I don't know if that's a helpful way of saying or describing it to me. I mean, you could just say that it's music and that it's constantly changing i mean you can play eight or nine of the notes on any chord and it's fine there's usually two or three that you don't want to play right and you just have to know which ones to avoid in every situation but i like to think of it more about compos it's, it's a composition in real time with shifting colors that's how i think about it like shifting colors where are we going to? It's, it's always about the journey from one chord to the next chord to the next chord. Different tonal centers, different key centers. It's not so much about just shifting. You know what I'm saying? Like a modal tune might be about shifting, but most jazz tunes with functional harmony are about like leading forward, like leading ahead. Like how do we get from this key center to the next key center? It's that journey, that tension and release more than it is about like these notes what's your favorite thing at itf so far favorite thing you're looking forward to i loved hearing um john fedchak's uh, uh, recital i'm looking forward to playing jen wharton's recital today um, i'm looking forward to i got a text from steve wiest we're going to play tomorrow night tonight is like concerto night and i know it's going to be really really awesome joe alessi is playing weston sprott who's also ridiculous uh, my favorite thing is just getting to see everybody i guess i also liked playing music 
but um, and getting to see it's super cool now to see my students coming through you know because I was always the younger one and I would always come to these things but not everybody would come and I understand why but these are our colleagues these are our people you know it's important if no if nobody in the trombone community wants to support you it's going to be that much harder to um, build a career you know especially in like modern jazz (laughs) people got to know who you are so show up to these things where there's people that care about what you do what was your scariest creepiest gig in terms of venue slash audience slash club owner played a lot of creepy gigs in europe and weird places played in berlin fall of 18 with this guy named kent Tompkins. he's a great composer in new york really hard music i'm not in the band it's alan ferber's in the band but I was subbing for Alan on this tour, some punk club, like you can, didn't, couldn't see it from the street and like up in some crazy like building, abandoned building. It wasn't like the club owner or anything, it's just like super out. These DIY spaces, I mean, it's cool, but like you know, it's a little just like dirty, nasty. And then yeah, just like Berlin is kind of a funky place, you know, some funky people around, which is a good thing I and mean, it gives the city character, but also, it's a little scary sometimes when you're it's late and you don't know where you are and stuff. So thoughts on Dixieland slash New Orleans trad? To me, well, those could be two different things, um, but I think it's important to know those styles as a foundation. Like I said, so my general approach with students is I like t- to work work out from the middle basically, and so the middle to me is bebop, hard bop, 1945 to 1965. That's like jazz in the sense of um, you know the classical sense of jazz that's the era that people think about tunes composers jj curtis slide blah, you know all those cats and then that's to get a foundation and then we go backwards and forwards you need to be able to know what tea garden did and how you could play like that or what vocabulary might be useful you need to know kid ori what did he do miff mall you know, all these cats that did stuff before there was J.J. So, you know, J.J., you can go back a little bit. To J.J.'s cat was Frank Rehack. And then there's people like Benny Green that kind of bridge the gap between um, Bebop and just the swing era cats but like Tommy Dorsey and like so many others that were more focused on like melody playing than improvisation. Anyway, so it's, it's an important part of the tradition and to be able to do it authentically is important and uh, I wouldn't say that I'm like a master of that style I would say that I'm aware of how to do it but you never know when you're gonna have to do those things so it's important to me to be able to do them especially if you want to work if you want to just play gigs you want to get in the scene play gigs well you got to know about these styles that goes back to being professional what we're talking about like know what to play do you do much big band arranging? Anything I can check out? Yeah, I do some big band arranging. There's some videos. I mostly have done stuff for like when I've been like a featured artist, but you can check out um, some stuff from the Jazz Trombone Day 2019. There's a couple of my tunes, Alternate Agenda. There's a tune, No Arrival. I've arranged my tune, Just Past the Horizon. But my tips are just to do it. You learn through doing it and getting it played. Study scores, look at voicings, you know, see how it all works, you know. And you just have to do it, you know, and figure out what sounds good, what sounds bad. Just start writing. So then two other things that I always think about when I'm writing for big band is like each section wants to sound good on their own, you know. So make sure everything sounds good on its own. And, if, and then everything sounds good altogether. I heard from Dave Berger something about like never have more than three like things happening at the same time. And so I try to keep that in mind. Sometimes I don't listen to that rule, but in general it's like, yeah, there's like a melody, there's harmony, there's a counter melody, or like there's three things happening, a, a, van, a rhythmic thing and a melodic thing and a background, you know, like three things. Uh, thanks for joining, thanks for getting on here. I gotta jump off. Thank you for being here. Happy Friday, live from ITF. If you're around, please come say hello. If you're not around, we'll see you next time. Uh, We'll be back back next week from another uh, on-the-road location. Check in with you guys later.